This is a New Hampshire Public Television special presentation. The New Hampshire Political Library and the New England Council present Politics and Eggs 2007 Candidate Series with Republican presidential candidate and former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney. With support from BAE Systems, Clean Harbors Environmental Services, Fidelity Investments. Please join me in welcoming Governor Mitt Romney. Thank you, Michael. It's an honor to be here this morning and to see so many friends and to see so many participants in the economy of New Hampshire and Massachusetts and all of New England. I appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, I'm going to take a few moments and, uh, and address you and then let you take uh, a lot more moments and ask me some questions. And uh, I, I do that with some trepidation, of course. I've begun, uh, you know, having a series of, of town hall meetings, if you will. But the term town hall meeting has already sort of been taken. So my staff had to come up with a different title, a different thing. What could they call these meetings I hold? And they said, let's call it an Ask Mitt Anything. And, and the problem with a title, Ask Mitt Anything, is that it, uh, it suggests that people, that they should do such a thing. And, <laughs> and so some of the questions I get are a little, uh, a little extreme, and, uh, and I do my very best to answer. I have, I have learned that I do not know the answer to all things. That came to me at a very young age. I was working on my uncle's ranch in Idaho when I was a 15-year-old and uh, was wandering away from the ranch one day and came across a, a uh, rancher that was raising sheep. And, uh, and I thought, I was pretty smart. I said to him, if I can guess the exact number of sheep in your herd, can I have one? And he said, yeah, take a guess. I said, 2,512. He said, unbelievable. That's the exact number of sheep in my herd. And so I picked up my animal, began walking away. He said, wait, 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 wait. If I can guess what your name is and what, what you're doing here, can I have my animal back? I said, sure. He said, you're that Romney fellow that, that's here with uh, Carl Richards. Came back here from Michigan for the summer, right? I said, how'd you know? He said, put down my dog, I'll tell you. <laughs> so I, I do not have the answers to all things. Or if I have answers, they're not exactly on target. I, uh, I began my career in the private sector. My life has not been in politics. This has not been what I expected I'd be doing in my life. Matter of fact, when I was a boy, I used to ask my dad about his life and his career. I loved cars. And my thought was always that someday, if I were really lucky, I could be head of a car company. And, uh, and that's what I really forecast for myself. Um, but uh, Dad uh, now and then would talk about politics, and he said, Mitt, I have advice for you. Don't get involved in politics if you have to win elections to pay your bills, because you don't want to ever have to worry about what you're saying in terms of your ability to, to meet your mortgage payment. And number two, don't get involved in, in a, a campaign unless your kids are raised because politics can turn their head and make them think there's something special when they're just like everybody else. And, uh, and I listened to his advice, thought to myself, I'll never become financially independent, and uh, our kids will always be in our home, so politics just wasn't something we expected to have as part of our life. But the time came when, surprisingly, our, our business had been more successful than I had ever imagined. The kids were now married and out of the home, and I got asked to go off and run the Olympics, not exactly politics, but it was a chance to say that I was going to be giving back in a way that made a great difference. And, uh, and then, of course, the chance to run for governor of Massachusetts was a bit of a shock, an improbable step to take. And, um, uh, and the, the responsibility to actually serve and to hopefully make a difference is something that weighs very heavily on me. There is a family tradition of giving at a time when you're able to. And uh, I do... Uh, I do take uh, some heart in, in uh, a, a conversation I had with a fellow in New York City. Uh, his name was Ezra Zilka. Uh, he's Jewish. He was born in Baghdad, uh, not a great place to be born as a Jew, uh, born some time ago there. He immigrated to this country in the 1950s, as I recall, and he became very successful as a businessman in, in New York City. And we were talking about American politics and what's happening to the country, and he said, Mitt, he said, what concerns me today about America is that politics has become a profession, not a duty. And I definitely fall in the category of those who serve out of a sense of duty. This is not my profession. My profession was working in the private sector, was building a business. 
Started off as a consulting business, which I was just a young guy in, and worked my way through that organization, and then began a venture capital company, which became more successful, and I learned a lot as I went along. Now, answering questions in each setting uh, can be somewhat challenging. I remember as a young consultant, I had just graduated from business school and uh, only been out uh, two or three years, as I recall, when I was asked to take on an assignment at a company that makes long underwear, the John Morgan Knitting Mills, and I was sent to Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. Mr. Morgan was probably in his 70s or so, and, uh, and he wanted to spruce up his company, make it more successful, and prepare it for sale, because he was nearing retirement age. And uh, so I was sent there to help him do this job, and I took a junior person with me. Now, I, you might think I was the most junior. There was actually someone more junior than me who hadn't even gone to business school. And we came into Morgan's, John Morgan's office, sat down. He was reading some papers, and uh, he looked up from the papers, and he stood up. And he was a big guy, like 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. He stood up and put both hands in the air, and he said, men, men, I needed men, and they sent me boys. Now, that sort, of, that sort of puts you on your heels as to how you're possibly going to be able to, to help him in a, in a setting like that. And uh, the improbable course of my career continued as I got involved in venture capital and either started a business, although generally behind an entrepreneur, or acquired a business. Acquiring a business from someone else is really kind of a gutsy thing to do. You think about it. One of the last companies that I helped acquire was Domino's Pizza. Not by the slice. I mean, we bought the whole company. And, uh, and you think about the likelihood that you're going to make money as an investor when you're buying a business, in this case from Tom Monahan, the guy that opened the very first Domino's Pizza store. He opened the first one, built it himself, built it to a multi-thousand outlet chain, billions of revenues. I'm sitting there writing him a check. He's decided <laughs> that now is the best time to sell and that he's gone out and hired a bank to shop it to everybody in the world. And we're the poor, poor guys that said, we'll pay more than anybody else. What's the likelihood you're going to make money at that? Not very good. Well, both from the consulting experience, which ended up being successful, and then the venture capital and private equity experience, which ended up being pretty successful, I learned that there is an approach to solving tough problems and to taking advantage of opportunities other people don't see. And the approach is not very complicated. It begins by saying, assemble the right people. Build an extraordinary team of leaders. Whatever endeavor you're embarked upon, bringing in people who have differing backgrounds, different perspectives, who are willing to debate with one another, who are deliberative and thoughtful, bring in good people. People who, Tom Stenberg at Staples used to say to me, you know, you always want to round your flat sides. Didn't know what he meant by that exactly, but he said everybody has a, a flat side. Some things they don't do so well. You want to bring in other people who do better the things that you don't do so well. And you want to bring a team in that rounds the flat sides of the other members. But that was number one. Number two was gather the data. Don't just work from opinion, but actually go out and gather information. Learn what's going on. Learn about the customers and the competitors and the, the, uh, the challenges and the differences in currency rates and look at the, and the, what your suppliers are doing and understand the cost structure of your business. Every piece of data you could get. In consulting, I used to call it wallowing in the data. In the first days of an assignment, consulting assignment, I'd go to the client and I'd say, I want to see all your data. They said, well, like what? I said, all of it. Just get, let me have access to everything you have. Back then, you know, it was boxes and boxes. Now, of course, you'd probably sit down with a computer and get it all done easily. But let me see all the data. Why? Because I and my team want to look at it and analyze it, see if the relationship, see if we can learn something from the history and something from the relationships that exist in the data. And then third, with the right people and the right data, we looked to see if there were hypotheses, if there were possible answers, if we could develop together a strategy, a course of action that would take advantage of opportunities, solve problems, and then once we'd set upon that strategy, we benchmarked how we were doing. We'd implement it, see if we're making progress according to the milestones. If we got off those milestones or those benchmarks, we knew that we'd made a mistake. It was time to go back and review our strategy or the way we were implementing it. That was the process, and it worked in the private sector. And I wondered, would it work in the Olympics? I got there, I found the Olympics was just like any other big enterprise. It had some differences, of course, in the way you worked with 
people. My board was 53 people. That's a little large, and they were all appointed by politicians, so that meant that they were looking for different things than, than a board that was appointed by shareholders, but we were able to get the job done. Then I came back to Massachusetts and won it again. Will that approach of leadership, will that work in the, in the private sector? And it worked gangbuster, in part because it's not done very often in the, in the, in the public sector where you actually bring in people of differing backgrounds. You may know that I had a, a number of what I called super cabinet secretaries, cabinet secretaries responsible for multiple other cabinet secretaries. And uh, I think there were probably four or five in total of these super cabinet secretaries. Two of them were in the opposition party, told me from the beginning in the debate that they were in the opposition party. One of them, Doug Foy, announced that he had sued Massachusetts more than any other person in history. And I put him in my cabinet. Why? I wanted that kind of critical thinking. I wanted somebody who really knew the ins and outs of government and, and where we were making mistakes and how to take advantage of the opportunities we had. So great team. Number two, data. When people came in with a problem, I wanted data, not just opinion. At the, at the, uh, at the very early days of my administration, uh, this guy Tom Stenberg from Staples came in to me and said, Mitt, if you want to help people, you'll find a way to get everybody health insurance. And I said, Tom, I can't do that because I'm not willing to raise taxes, and that's what it would take, and I'm not willing to have a government takeover of health care, that's what else it would take. And then he just said, I hear you, but if you really want to help people, find a way to get everybody health insurance. And so, you know, I said goodbye to him, a little frustrated that he was so obviously ill-informed. And uh, as time went on, what he said began to wear on me. And I said, you know, if this were a problem in an enterprise that I owned and ran, a business, I know what I do. I bring in a team of people that had different backgrounds. I start gathering data, start looking for relationships and seeing if we can come up, come up with something. So that's what I did. I got the, uh, the head of a consulting firm in Boston. I got my old partner from Bain Capital. I got an investment banker from JP Morgan. Uh, I got a uh, young woman, Cindy Gillespie, who'd worked in the federal government on a whole series of tough problems. And she'd worked with me at the Olympics as well. I got some actuaries from an insurance company. We all came together. We'd meet and talk. We made no progress for about a year. Just, kept, just talked around and around, couldn't see our way out of the problem. But we began gathering data. Oh, I didn't mention we had a professor from MIT, uh, John Gruber, Gruber who, who began gathering data about who didn't have insurance. And everything we thought about who didn't have insurance was wrong. See, we thought the people that didn't have insurance in our state were people who were uh, largely going to be minority single moms. And, it, and that this was going to be a group that no insurance company would want to touch. They'd be uninsurable. Government would have to provide all their care. What we found out was the majority of these people were majority single males. And uh, they were easily insurable. They were generally healthy. The reason they didn't have health insurance is they didn't think they needed it. So we began seeing that some of the things we thought were just simply wrong. Long and short of this was, as you know, being either from Massachusetts or being a neighbor of Massachusetts, we found a way to get everybody health insurance, which did not require a new tax structure or new taxes, did not require the government getting more into health care. It actually allows the government to get out of one portion of health care. So the approach, the approach which I saw in the private sector very much works in the governmental sector. Oh, there's some differences too. There's opposition and that happens occur from time to time and you have to work differently, but the, the approach works well. I just note that federally, our country faces some extraordinary challenges, and you know that, and also some amazing opportunities. We, we uh, in our political speak, almost always talk about the challenges. Iraq, Iran, violent jihad, for good reason. I mean, those are right in our face and are the most threatening things that are happening in the world today. A nuclear Iran is a very frightening uh, threat to the world order and to peace and to our survival as, as, as humanity. And so that, they're a huge threat. But that's, that's one challenge. We face other challenges. The emergence of Asia as a competitor is tough. A lot of you who are in manufacturing know that as you see jobs increasingly being competed for overseas. We're spending too much money. Our entitlements are out of whack. We're using too much oil. You heard the, the comments we talked about last night. Republicans all talked about those challenges. Don't forget as well, we can deal with those problems. We can overcome them all. Americans always rise to the occasion as long as the leaders of the country 
tells the American people the truth, lays out the track that we have to follow to overcome the challenges, and then actually leads. Don't also forget that in addition to all those challenges, we've, we now have opportunities of a generation or of a century. And I touched on this real briefly last night, but it's going to have to get fleshed out in, in the days that come, and that is the, uh, the emergence of Asia is uh, frightening news to one degree for those of us who compete with Asian companies. It is also very exciting news because one billion people having come in the workforce over the last decade means one billion new consumers into the world marketplace. And we've had very little access to those consumers in the past and now they're interested in buying medicines, medical equipment, software, hardware. They're going to be interested in, in energy products that reduce CO2 emissions. They're going to be interested in fuel technologies, material science. Some of the leading edge technologies which we have, they're going to want. And we're going to have the opportunity to participate in another part of the world that's going to be a rapid growth part of the world. This can be the new frontier of the 21st century for America, the new economic frontier, where we become more familiar with the, with the broad expanse of Asia. We, uh, we sell products and services and, and technologies and and provide to our workers here and our entrepreneurs here whole new marketplaces. Because if we just focus on the United States alone, we're only going to grow at what, one, one and a half, two percent? Well, not even that fast, one, one and a half percent a year. If we pull up the drawbridge, like our Democratic friends are saying, oh, it's very frightening out there, pull up the drawbridge, don't want to compete, guess what? We'll grow at the rate of the American uh, population. And if we want to instead grow at high rates as we always have, we're going to have to open our eyes to the world and keep on pursuing the, the vibrant uh, uh, policies that have led us to lead the world time and time again. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a breath here and take a, uh, take a turn from you to ask some questions. Uh, I'm excited about the future. I'm optimistic about what, what we face because I know we will overcome our challenges. We always have before. I have seen the heart of the American people. They rise to the occasion time and time again. I'm also excited because I see these opportunities. I see a chance for us to do something which our grandparents would have thought to be unimaginable, which is not only to compete in the Americas, not only to compete in Europe as we do, but to be able now to compete across the entire globe and to have Asia with the extraordinary population of Asia and the interest in so many things American, culturally in Asia, to have that open to our markets and to our technology and to our innovation and to our, our fundamental and core beliefs, that's a very exciting thing to me. Um, with that, I'm going to say thank you for the chance to get together with you this morning. Your, your interest in politics in New Hampshire is something the entire nation ought to respect. I do. You sift through the candidates in a very personal way. You see, I, I know there are a lot of people that think that Iowa and New Hampshire play too key a role. And maybe we should let a more, quote, representative state that has l larger scale or diversity be the first in the nation. I disagree with that. I value the fact that Iowa and New Hampshire are able to take the time and have the interest to get to know the candidates on a personal basis. I have seen most of you before. You will see all of the candidates for president. You will make your decision not based on who has the best 30 second ad with the best announcer's voice that comes over the air. You will instead make your decision based on having looked in the face of the candidate for president and shaken his or her hand. That is a service the nation needs. You will know our character, whether we're real or phony, and it's a service that is valuable to this country. Thank you so very much. I see that there are a couple of microphones over there, so I guess the, uh, the cameras here want to pick that up. So if you've got the microphone, you can, you can pass where it's going to go. Um, welcome to New Hampshire. And thank, thank you, you for good, coming. Good to be here. I spent the night at Wolfboro last night. Ah, lovely place. I'm Dick Stevens with the New Hampshire High Technology Council. Last night's debate focused on, to me, three issues. The one was the war in Iraq and more appropriately, what's a response to a global religious-based terrorism. Second was conservatism, and who is more conservative than the other 
candidates. And the third topic was religion. And it struck me as in listening to all of the conservative candidates that there's a lot more in the religious agenda that doesn't fall into the standard conservatives, less government, lower taxes, promote business agenda. And New Hampshire's a technology state. We've got a lot of scientists and engineers here and a lot of other smart people. And we hear that the world is flat and it's only 8,000 years old. And how do we take you as a group seriously? How do you take we as a group seriously? I think what you have in the group of people who are there, a group of individuals that I think almost to a person, there may be one or two exceptions, who unlike the Democratic Party, re recognizes that we are facing global jihad. That was the first issue you mentioned. It's a huge distinction between our debate and the one of two days before. In the, in the debate of two days before, you saw, you saw hope but not policy based on reality. To have a candidate for president like John Edwards say that there is not a war on terror, that that's just a bumper sticker, bespeaks a, a complete lack of, lack of understanding of what's going on in the world. It means he's not reading what's happened in Indonesia. He hasn't understood what's happened in Nigeria and in Thailand and in Pakistan and in Tanzania and in Kenya and in Egypt and in Morocco and in Madrid and in London and in New York and in Boston and in Virginia. It means he thinks that somehow that this is all just about uh, the United States and uh, as soon as we come home and prosecute these people, everything will be fine. There is war going on within the world of Islam. It's not just a clash of civilizations, as Samuel Huntington spoke about. It's a clash within a civilization. And the effort within that civilization is pretty straightforward, which is a narrow slice of radical, violent jihadists of two very different types, Shia and Sunni, are, are, are vying to take over all the governments of moderate Islam and replace them with a religious leadership. If that were to happen, and if an Ahmadinejad type leader were to rule the world of Islam with a nuclear weapon, you would have a Hitlerian circumstance again. And the idea that they would somehow stop where they are and not continue to expand is just not realistic. They talk about wanting to take all the Muslim lands that have ever been Muslim. That, by the way, means France and Spain, too. And evil generally does not know a border. So we have to recognize that this is a threat to us and to civilization broadly. That's one huge difference between us and the Democrats. The second difference is the Republicans, by and large, understand how the economy works. We understand something that most people don't. I think if you were to ask the Democrats at their debate, what happens with corporate profit? When you hear that a corporation is profitable, where does it go? I think most of them, in a, you know, if they had a multiple choice uh, answer would say, corporate profits go to pay executives bonuses. And you'd say, well, I got some news for you. Corporate profit is what's reported after the bonuses have been paid. So none of it goes to pay uh, bonuses of executives. They'd say, oh, well, then it goes to pay shareholders. Do you know what a small slice of corporate profit actually goes out in dividends? It's tiny, tiny. Most corporations in this room, my guess is, don't even pay any dividends. So where do co corporate profits go? Corporate profits go to build working capital and capital expenditures so the business can grow. That's where corporate profits go. The best news a country can have is that the corporate profits are growing and doing well because that means they can invest in growth. That's one of the great things about this country. We have concerns about oil profits, not because they're prof so profitable as much as from the fact that they're not investing it, reinvesting it in capital and growth like they ought to. And that's a real concern to us. And of course, we're concerned about the money made by the nations that own the oil. Finally, with regards to the, the religious issues, uh, th there may be some who, uh, who, who try and uh, project uh, a particular brand of faith um, as they think about, uh, about the course of America. I don't know that I saw that at all last night. There, there may have been a circumstance of it. I didn't uh, hear that myself. Um, I think the fundamental values of religious faith are shared among the people who are on the platform, and it's a value that, that su su suggests that, that, uh, that there is a creator, that we're all one family. I think that's a healthy value for us to recognize that people in Africa who are suffering are all part of our family, as opposed to just saying, we don't care about anybody out there. Sometimes I, I'm dismayed by the fact that we, we, we appropriately recognize that we have 3,400 plus servicemen in our nation that have been killed in Iraq, but we don't mention how many people in Iraq have been killed. I mean, I think we should mention the total casualties. 
and it's very, very large indeed, as many as 100,000 more. Um, we're a family of humanity. I think that's something that flows from religious conviction. Um, there are other things I think that flow from, from that conviction. Uh, one of them is that we should serve others, care for others. One is, that, that, one is that liberty is a principle above and beyond practicality, that God has endowed humans with inalienable rights, including our liberty, and therefore that this is something which we should have in our country and promote elsewhere. So those are the values I think that are, that are part of a, of a religious foundation that, that in my view are a meaningful part of, of, of America's discourse. But when it comes to comparing parties, um, there's probably not as big a difference on religious values as there is a difference on the war on jihad and an understanding of what makes our economy work. And if we're going to win the war on jihad, and if we're going to take advantage of the opportunity, the frontier of the, the economic frontier of the 21st century, we're going to need to have a Republican president. Thank you. Good question. I'm, I'm going to let the guy with the microphone uh, decide where these, uh, these questions go. <laughs> go ahead. The, uh, the reputation of the United States has suffered in recent years on the international stage, and uh, there's even been some recent studies that have shown that the majority of the world now hates Americans. Uh, do you see this as a critical issue, and what do you tend to do to address it? Thank you. Um, I, I do think that we have suffered over the past several years uh, for a number of reasons, and I think you probably know what they are. Um, I, I think our, our entry into Iraq was seen by many as being a unilateral decision and was not done on a, on a collaborative basis. There were many nations that went along with us, um, uh, but there were a number of others that were critical of us. We obviously have to re reserve for ourselves the right to do what we think is in, in our best interest and in the best interest of, of others. Um, and, uh, and we took that action. But I think there has been the perception that we have not been as open and participative with other nations as, as is our normal uh, approach. And I think what's going to have to happen uh, when a new president is elected is to engage in an effort to build much t closer ties to the nations of the world. Um, there are a few countries and a few people that have demonstrated themselves as being so evil that we will cut off our engagement with those countries. In my view, Ahmadinejad, Castro are two of that category. With the others, with most of the others, I'm not going through the full list, but with most of the others, even those that are doing authoritative and, and uh, outrageous acts like Putin in, in Russia, I don't want to cut off talking. I want to be able to talk and keep the dialogue going and seeing if we can't re-engage some of these nations in pursuing human rights and open economies and the like. Um, but I believe that it's going to be incumbent on the next president to be very active to make sure that our friends in Latin America know who we are and know that they're always welcome in the White House and to know that our aid is associated with our recognition of the value that they have to the world. I think we want to establish closer ties with our European friends, uh, particularly now with, uh, uh, with President Sarkozy in France. It's, uh, I think it's interesting that the, ho the whole world is looking to lower their taxes and the Democrats are looking to raise ours. Uh, Sarkozy can be a, a, a blood brother, if you will, in this effort, and, and we can't, you know, beat our chest about it by any means, but there is a great opportunity for America to reach out to the world and to, and to establish closer working relationships. One of the ways I want to do that, by the way, is in something I call a partnership for progress and prosperity, which is bringing all of the nations of the world together, not the UN. The UN, it plays a role, but the UN has been really a disappointment. I mean, the UN has not sanctioned, the UN Human Rights Council has not sanctioned Sudan for human rights violations. There's genocide going on there, and they haven't sanctioned um, uh, Sudan. They have, however, sanctioned Israel, I think, nine times. I mean, it's just the, the organization is broken. But we need to bring together the civilized nations of the world to work together to ask nations like Jordan and, and uh, Turkey and, and Egypt, how do we help moderate Islamic states have stronger underpinnings of stability and democracy so that these states can lead in the effort to defeat the jihad. Because we can't go around the world fighting the jihad everywhere ourselves. They're going to have to do it. Ultimately, they're the best course. And so these kinds of efforts to rebuild our relationships on a personal basis and then to link in important and meaningful entities and alliances like this partnership I'm describing, I think will rebuild that trust. And something else I think is important to remember for those that get a little discouraged when, whenever you go somewhere. Well, you saw Miss Universe, you saw the clips of Miss Universe being uh, hosted in Mexico and the crowds booing uh, because she was American. And, uh, and, and you see that and you think, gosh, what's going on there? 
Uh, and I've asked a couple of my friends that are from outside the country, what's going on? What's the attitude? And they said, well, we're a little angry at you right now. We're angry at how badly you've messed up Iraq and other things that, that anger us, the perception that you're unilateralist, that you don't care about what anyone else thinks or does. And he said, but fundamentally, you ought to know, in our heart of hearts, we want a strong America. We believe in America. Whenever things are really tough, we know we turn to America. I, uh, I had a, uh, a meeting with uh, a small group of people um, at the, uh, the home of the Consul General of, of Israel. It was in Boston, and uh, the former Prime Minister of Israel came to Boston, Shimon Peres, and, uh, and a small group there. One of them said, what do you think about the conflict in Iraq? And he said, I want to put this in context. He said, in the uh, annals of history, America is unique. He said, in history, whenever there's war, the nation that loses has to give up land to the nation that wins. And he said, one nation in the history of the world has laid down hundreds of thousands of lives and taken no land for itself. That was during this last century, First World War and the Second World War. America took no land from the Germans, no land from the Japanese. America, all America takes is enough land to bury our dead. America fights for freedom, for freedom-loving people like ourselves and our friends around the world. That fact is not lost on the people of the world. America is loved fundamentally, our people are loved fundamentally, but we can do a better job reminding people that we will work with them to build a stronger and safer world. Thank you. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Thousands of our children here in New Hampshire do not have access to quality early learning or child care programs, and thousands more are unsupervised when they get out of school in the afternoons. Could you tell me what you would do to help ensure that our youngest, most vulnerable citizens are safe and cared for while their parents are at work? Yeah, there, there are a couple things. Uh, one, I'm a uh, big believer in effective long school days. And, uh, and I was with uh, Governor Schwarzenegger in California, and he told me about a program they had there, which I thought was a very good one. We, we've tried to pioneer this in our state as well, of Massachusetts. Uh, and, and they did it there, I think, through ballot initiative and that is that they have a program that schools can apply for to get funding for after-school programs that keep the kids in school until 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I think it's a good idea. By the way, they don't have the, the, uh, the teachers stay all day. They instead have groups like uh, Boys and Girls Clubs or others that come into the school, manage sport programs, study halls, uh, uh, cultural learning programs, and so forth, but they have school in operation throughout the entire day. I think that's a great idea. And, uh, and, and encourage that as a, as a philosophy generally. Uh, with regards to early education programs, of course, uh, I'd like to look at, at the data and see which of those are successful and which are not. In, in my own state, I looked at some of the, the Head Start data, and I must admit to not having been very impressed that Head Start was, was accomplishing a great deal more than, than just child care. And child care is fine. It's a good service for, for adults. But in terms of actually educating kids and preparing them, for, for the, uh, the demands of, an edu of a, you know, of a uh, school, it didn't seem that they were making the kind of progress you'd hope for. So I wanted to look and see more what kind of progress they're actually going to make. Um, one thing I will note, and that is that I think the most important work that goes on in America for our future is the work that goes on within the four walls of the American home. And uh, in, in my state, I was concerned when I saw the number of kids being born out of wedlock. It is really tough to have an after-school program or a before-school program if, mom, if there's just a single parent trying to manage their life and their kid's life. There's some fabulous and, and remarkable single moms and single dads and grandparents raising kids, but it is nonetheless a huge advantage if you have a mom and a dad associated with the nurturing of a child. And I, I, uh, I think it's important for us to do our very best to encourage kids to finish high school, and then after high school, if they fall in love, to get married. And then after they're married, to have babies. And we've somehow gotten that upside down uh, in the last uh, couple of decades in this country. Let me note uh, in that regard one other thing. I, I was meeting with some teachers in, in uh, one of my cities and asked them how they could uh, tell me whether kids in their schools were going to do better or worse and uh, which kids were going to be the best kids. They said, well, it's pretty simple. We don't have any failing kids if the mom and dad show up at parent-teacher night. If moms and dads are involved and concerned about their child's education, the kids are just fine. And I resolved to myself at that point, I want to encourage people to get married before they have kids 
and number two, to get involved in the education of their child. And so I proposed something which I'm still fighting for. It didn't get passed by my legislature yet. But the idea is this. Most of our schools in Massachusetts are just doing superbly well. As a matter of fact, the state average school is ranked number one in America. So we're doing pretty well on average, but about 10% of our schools are leaving a lot of kids behind. Mostly are urban schools, but not all. And I said, I'd like to have a proposal, a, a provision in Massachusetts that the parents of the kids in the bottom 10% of schools, that those parents must attend a parental preparation class before they send their child off to school for the first time, where they learn about the education culture here, they learn about what good after-school programs are available in their community, what preschool programs and, and uh, child care programs are available to them, that they learn about what TV to watch, what TV not to watch, they learn about discipline in school, homework in school, parent-teacher night. I think we need to make, make it clear that par parenting is integrally involved with teaching and that teachers and parents are partners in this effort. But getting back to your original question, uh, making sure that we have funding for a longer school day is, in my opinion, a very high priority. Thank you. There's the man with the microphone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, speaking of families um, and back to the military, what would you propose or what are your thoughts on strengthening the military families? Because for a young enlisted family, they actually qualify for food stamps. And we're going to start experiencing troop fatigue and people not re-enlisting, people not stepping up to enlist or officer and enlisted. What are your thoughts on military families? Well, there are two things at least we're going to have to do to uh, strengthen our military and support our military families. One is increase the number of men and women in the military. One of the reasons we've had so many active tours of duty, people going back into, the, uh, in, into combat settings, which is probably the toughest thing on a military family there is, is that we have too few troops. And therefore, the rotations are faster as they go back into combat settings. And we need to, therefore, increase our military by at least 100,000. Following the, the, uh, the collapse of the, of the Cold War, uh, Bill Clinton and others spoke about a, a holiday, excuse me, they spoke about a, uh, a, a, a dividend, a peace dividend. And uh, we got the dividend, but we didn't get the peace. There is still evil in the world. They, they reduced our, our military in the years that followed by some 500,000 troops. We're going to have to add back at least 100,000 and probably more so that when we have a, a combat setting, we don't have the kind of rotations that make it so hard on our families. Secondly, uh, we're going to have to improve the benefits associated with being in our military. To attract an additional 100,000 or 200,000 men and women, we're going to have to improve those benefits. And by the way, that does work. A GI-type bill does work when you're looking to recruit people. We, uh, in our state, we had our National Guard was losing enrollment every year. And after several years of that happening, the legislature and I got together and, and proposed and put together a bill which was ultimately called the Welcome Home Bill. I called it the Massachusetts GI Bill, but we changed the name to the Welcome Home Bill. And, uh, and in that bill, we said if anybody signs up for the National Guard in our state, they get four years tuition and fee free in any Massachusetts public institution of higher learning. That then took our enrollments up 30% the next year. So we need to make sure that we have benefits programs that are consistent with, uh, with the needs uh, that, our, that our people have. And I believe that, you know, I hate to say it, but evil exists in the world. And you go back to the very beginning, Cain killed Abel. And uh, uh, there, there has been evil from the very beginning of time. And I believe there will continue to be. I don't know how long this violent jihad will go on. But as you look around the world and see what's happening, you have to say to yourself that, the, that America must remain strong. The best ally peace has ever known in this world has been a strong America. And I believe that, that we're going to need to have additional troops. I think we need to spend additional funding on the equipment our troops need on the battlefield. And we're going to need to spend the additional money that our veterans need and deserve when they come home. That's probably the other point I'd make, which is I think, I think we've seen that there's been such a shift in, in veterans' expenses. I think I can get the numbers pretty close to right. During the Second World War, it wasn't the First World War, but either the First or Second World War, for each soldier killed, there were two that came back that were badly injured, two. And so the cost of the veteran system had to deal with those two per, per, uh, uh, per death. Now it's 16 come home for every one killed, which 
talks about our fabulous medical system out there to get people and get them treated and, and so forth. We're doing a great job, but it means we have 16 people coming home. For every one you hear about that's been killed, another 16 have come home with major injuries. And that means our veterans' care system is going to have to be up to the snuff to, uh, to make sure that our soldiers are, are, are getting the kind of care and treatment they deserve. Thank you. Great question. I think I'm going to have to let you folks go to work. I could keep you here all day and make sure you never get anything done, but I'll, why don't we take one last question? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Governor Mike Harrington, following up on a question asked earlier about the uh, diminution of our global standing, I hope I'm paraphrasing you correctly, but I think I heard from the early South Carolina debate your advocacy for the retention of Guantanamo in an enlargement of the capacity and an effort to suggest also negating efforts to provide appropriate legal advice uh, is at least what I heard is a sound bite or a part of that particular debate. Could you, just out of my puzzlement looking at the global disapprobation, address that issue further as to the basis for those comments if I'm accurately conveying what you said. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, actually, I think some people see Guantanamo as a source of America's arrogance, and I see it as a source of America's resolve. I believe that people recognize that we are in a global fight against terror, and that there are people who are trying to kill members of their own society and our society, and that bringing them to this country and treating them like, like criminals as opposed to like violent war uh, perpetrators is a mistake. What, when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was picked up, when the mastermind of 9-11 was picked up, the first thing he said to the people in the CIA who got him was, I'll see you in New York and you can talk to my lawyer. That's what he said. Well, we saw him in Guantanamo where he did not speak with his lawyer and instead over a long period of time was questioned and through the questioning that was given to, to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the head of the CIA has said we were able to stop and, 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 uh, and infiltrate numerous attacks on this country and others. Now, I believe in having a process where we don't take these guys who are blowing us up, who are not part of any army or any nation, we don't bring them into New York, assign them a, a council because they, they can't afford one themselves, so what is afforded to them, and they come into our court system. That is not the way that wars are fought. And we are in, and this is again a distinction between ourselves and the Democrats. They believe that this is a, a criminal activity, that we need to give them lawyers and, and bring them into the courthouses, and that's not what's going on here. Look around the world and look how people who are dealing with this issue are dealing with it. And in my view, we need to have a place where, where we can bring in very, very dangerous people to interrogate them, to learn what we can. Of course, we're not going to torture them. We do not torture. I have to be honest with you. It made me somewhat angry when I heard people keep talking about we have to stop American torture. That is not what we do. We do not torture people. But we do take these people in, and I've been to Guantanamo, and ha as have relief agencies from all over the world. I think the number, it's in the hundreds of visits have been made by various organizations without complaint. It's a very, I took the head of my prison system down there. We took, the head of my prison system ca came back and said, I've got some advice for you. She said, it's too lax down there. You've made it too, too open, too much, too much congregation space. It's too dangerous. You guys are being too, too nice, if you will. The food down there is unbelievable. It's, it's a, this is not this gulag. This is a, a, a modern prison uh, which, which treats people with dignity and respect where we have interrogators. And by the way, they're not, they, 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 I won't go through all the techniques, but I spent some time with Kofor Black, who used to be uh, in charge of the CIA's counterterrorism effort for some 20 years, he was with the CIA. He said, "Look, the best information you get from these people is to have sort of the good cop, bad cop, and you you know you work with people over a matter of months and months and months. You don't torture them. You don't do anything like torture. You don't get the best information. The only time you use those aggressive interrogation techniques that do not rise to the area of torture is if someone thinks there's a bomb going off in the next 24 hours." Then you can't use the old slow processes. You have to use something that's not as good, but it's all you got. And uh, that doesn't happen there, hasn't happened uh, uh, that I know of there. But uh, I believe it's important for us as we look at our posture around the world to reach out to the world, to talk to the world, 
but not to, not to cower. I think we gain the greatest respect and admiration of the world when we're shown as being strong and having resolve and strong leadership and not backing away anytime. Some of the mainstream media says, oh, you ought to do this, instead, or some, some nation instead say, no, here's what we're doing, here's why we're doing it, we're going to work with you, we're going to collaborate with you in the things that are most important. That's my, uh, that's my own view. This is a, uh, it's quite a time. You know, every time you run for office or you've seen a politician get up and run for office, they tell you it's a critical election. This is a critical election. Maybe they are, they're all critical. I don't know. But we're at one of those junction points in American history, one of those inflection points where we're either going to take a turn where the leadership of our country will be Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, and Hillary Clinton, where you will have single-payer, socialized-style medicine, where the government's going to take over health care, 17% of your economy is going to be managed by the government, and it'll be creeping, but they're going to take it over, where there's going to be increasing effort to pull up the drawbridge so we don't have to compete overseas. And uh, it's, you know, we're going to talk about all these excuses for, for trying to keep from trading overseas, which means the opportunities to sell products overseas will be restricted just as much. And as you know, we're enormously successful as a society because we do trade overseas. But they're going to try and rein that in. They're going to be taking this country in a, in a very different direction. They'll see the jihad as, a, as an effort that's on over there. So if we just bring everybody home, why we won't worry about what's going on over there. Um, they're uh, they're going to be uh, weakening our military. I mean, I said we're for strong military, strong economy, strong families. If Democrats are elected, we'll have a weaker military. Why is that? Because they'll have to bring down military spending to fund their social programs. We'll have a weaker economy for the reasons I've mentioned in terms of competing globally and because they'll have to raise your taxes. One thing you saw in the Democratic debate, I think every single candidate said they will raise taxes. And if they raise taxes on anybody in this country, that means less money going into innovation, into technology, into new businesses, and it means more money going into government for programs. That will slow the economy. And then with regards to family and family values, I'd, I'd say the same thing. So this is a, this is a watershed election. And uh, I need all your help and all your money. With that, thanks so much. Good to be with you. Thank you, Governor Romney, and uh, that concludes this morning's program. Uh, we'll be back to you uh, with uh, future candidates uh, in the weeks ahead. Take care. New Hampshire Public Television is proud to be a production partner of this Politics and Eggs webcast and the Video Archives project. Politics and Eggs is a project of the New Hampshire Political Library and the New England Council with support from BAE Systems, Clean Harbors Environmental Services, and Fidelity Investments.